Well, my name is Mike Rose, and I teach at UCLA in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies. Um, some of the books I've written, um, The Mind at Work, Valuing the Intelligence of the American Worker, and that's a book where I try to get in very close to a lot of blue collar and service jobs and demonstrate the kind of thinking involved in this work. And then I try to tie these different case studies of waitressing and plumbing and welding and um, carpentry and a range of different jobs that try and tie these into sort of broader social issues, like how do we define intelligence and how should we define intelligence in a democracy? Yeah. Well, The Mind at Work is an interesting book for me because it, it comes from something very deep in my own background. I come from a working class background and all of my forebears were worked in restaurants or in the railroad yards or in the automotive. And, and, and so that's where I come from. That's a part of, that's a part of me. Um, but I've also, obviously I'm a professor in a university, so I've developed um, a lot of academic training. And a lot of the academic training I've developed has to do with learning and teaching and the nature of intelligence. And so the mind at work represents, for me, the kind of bringing together of these two worlds of mine. Bringing this knowledge that I have about learning and intelligence and skill and talent and ability and bringing that back onto all of these kinds of work that I grew up amidst. So I spent uh, three or four years with tradesmen, with service workers, uh, watching closely what they do, talking to them, in some cases performing little kinds of tests and experiments with them, and then I try to document the, in fact, significant amount of intelligence and thought and problem solving and troubleshooting uh, and the knowledge base that you need to do this kind of work well. So I spent four, four or five years, you know, um, traveling around, getting in close to these various kinds of work. And they're work that I knew from my own past. You know, I never performed them or never performed them well. But I knew them growing up from my mother, my uncles, my forebears. And to get in close to it, to really spend time with craftspersons, with tradespeople, service workers, when they're doing their work well, you just get such a strong sense of how much skill and thought goes into the work. There's such an expression, such a manifestation of a real power of mind, the building of a knowledge base, the using of the knowledge to solve problems. Uh, it's a powerful thing in the culture, and I don't think we appreciate it as richly and deeply as we should, because if we did more fully appreciate it, I think it would have a lot to do with the way we think about schooling, a lot to do with the way we think about organizing work, and I think it would help us also think about some of the cultural divides that create such difficulty for us in the United States. Let's take the carpenter. So uh, obviously carpentry involves um, a lot of mathematics um, and it involves to the developing of a sense of mathematical qualities, an eye for it, like symmetry and proportion and the, the qualities of angles, right? Um, good carpenters can just look at something and, and know if it's right or wrong. Uh, there's lots of problem solving that goes on, lots of troubleshooting. Um, let me give you a quick, quick example of, of the kind of thing that just fascinates me. I was watching a guy installing a set of um, French doors, sliding French doors. And they, were, they were already prefabbed and everything, but he was putting them in a kind of tight space. And so I'm, I'm sitting back and I'm watching him and suddenly he just stops everything and he sits back and, and I asked him to just talk out loud. I said, what are you thinking about right now? And he said, well, I'm imagining these doors and I'm just wondering if there's going to be any problem as they slide back and forth in their setting. And then he said, I noticed that the casings that came with the setup they really don't match the other casings in this room, so I'm going to have to refashion those so that they don't look funny. And then he said, I was thinking too about the threshold on the outside. I've got to angle it just right so that the water runs right off it if it rains. Now that's a pretty remarkable thing. Think of the visualizing he's doing. He's thinking ahead. He's imagining the way 
Um, these doors are going to slide across the fittings. He's picturing the casing. He, uh, he's, he sees that there's these p potential problems with the aesthetics of the thing. So there's aesthetic stuff, mechanical stuff going on all simultaneously in his mind. These are the kinds of remarkable skills that you see in play when somebody's a good carpenter. There's so many challenges that they face that they have to creatively solve all the time. You know, how do you install this cabinet in a, in a, in a setting that's now not even? Uh, what do you do when a fixture is no longer available? Um, how do you uh, figure out what to do with stuff that's behind a wall that you can't see and you can only feel and you can kind of make some judgments about that? So it's interesting because we tend to think of creativity, this is an interesting point, I think. We tend to think of creativity in terms of like the big burst of a thing, you know, somebody writing a song or somebody making a movie. But there's also constant examples of everyday creativity around us. People facing just these everyday kinds of tasks that aren't easy to solve. And they think them through and they solve it. And it's that everyday creativity that keeps the world going as much as the big moments of creativity. There's long-standing cultural biases in the United States about blue collar and service work. And it's funny, I mean, we, we pride ourselves on being an egalitarian democratic society. And certainly in many ways we are, but we still hold to a lot of these biases and they go far back in the Republic. Um, the distinction between blue collar work and white collar work the distinction between work of the hand and work of the mind. Um, in school, the difference between the academic and the vocational track. Uh, and on it goes, these kinds of oppositions, these binaries that we carry in our head. And they are loaded with implications about status and intelligence. We think that people who work with their hands are just not as bright, you know? I mean, that's just a cultural prejudice. So I think we've got a lot of long-standing biases that are funny in a democratic country, and they come into play when we think about these different occupations. And I think they do a great disservice to those occupations. It, it is a, it's an undemocratic strain in a democratic culture. Interesting, isn't it? It's a kind of contradiction. Um, and blue-collar folks feel it. I mean, I grew up, I know, I mean, I. I felt it, I witnessed it, I saw it uh, as, as I was growing up with my own family members. Um, but it is, it's an interesting, interesting contradiction. In a democratic society, we have these undemocratic strains and traits that run through our cultural history. A lot of cultural attitudes of any kind, you know, about race, about gender, about region of the country, about how people talk, about, about how people look, appearance about age, right? All these different kinds of biases and screens that we carry with us, they're not always that conscious, you know? They're not always that conscious. It doesn't make them any less real, but I think that they're there and they play out in lots of different ways.